At some point or another, you've probably seen the popular animated Disney film Beauty and the Beast, which was released about 30 years ago to tremendous praise from critics and audiences alike. And I'm not going to waste your time with a summary of the film because you've probably already seen it by now. And if not, you're definitely going to want to watch it after we get done because I am going to provide to you today a proper understanding of that story. And the first thing to kind of keep in mind before we get started is that how much time we spend with each of the characters, which perspectives we see them from, what we see them doing, what we don't see them doing, all of these things affect our perception of the story, who we sympathize with, who we're rooting for, etc. And Beauty and the Beast utilizes this quite well in order to push a radically feminist and destructive agenda that attacks masculinity, it attacks order, civilized society, strength, among many other things. There really just are so many important themes in this film that we have to discuss. And I get to do my favorite thing ever, which is overanalyze something in a way that is in accordance with my worldview. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Do stay tuned. John Doyle in. Heck off, Kami. Hello there, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Heck Off Kami. This will be the final video of the year. So Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year to you all. My birthday's on the 22nd, so remember, you have to be nice to me. But we've got big plans in store for 2022. But I figured that this would be a good note to end the year on because it does outline a very practical political ideology for us going forward, which, of course, is neo gastonism And that's why it's been my Instagram bio for the last few months. And people are Googling it like, what's a neo gastonist Well, it's you after you watch the video, at least. So... The background of this is, I think it was last spring around Easter, I was with a young lady and she wanted to watch a Disney movie. And so I'm like, you know, all right, we'll pick one, we can watch it. So she's scrolling and she's like, well, how about Beauty and the Beast? And you know, I had seen this a couple times back in my youth and so I liked it well enough. And so I was like, yeah, you know, that's fine. So we're watching it. And then about five minutes into the film, the purported villain of the film appears on screen, Gaston. And keep in mind, I'm like tired, I'm falling asleep. I don't really even wanna be watching this movie, so you know. But Gaston comes on screen and he immediately takes Belle's book from her and tells her that women shouldn't be reading books because then they might get ideas in their head. I just, that woke me up. I just immediately, I was like, for the rest of the movie, on the edge of my seat, just in awe, watching how based Gaston is and how implicitly right-wing this whole story is. And this girl, she had to witness the most eccentric behavior, eccentric, not autistic, eccentric behavior that she'd probably ever seen in her life. Like, she just wanted to watch a Disney movie, and I'm like over here taking notes on my phone, like connecting all of the themes to these really esoteric references and interpretations. And so, yeah, this is from where I formulated the political ideology of neo-Gastonism. And it's important to remember that what we talk about in the beginning how even with stories our perceptions of them are often forced in order to manipulate certain outcomes that might influence our future perceptions or decisions so Anyone who watches this film will easily identify Gaston as the antagonist. And this is done intentionally because the messaging of this film is actually deeply progressive. And that's the part I'm not joking about. Like, I'm going to overanalyze it for sport, but that part is actually true. And this is most obvious with the dynamic between Belle and Gaston, but also just in the fact that the audience is made to believe that Gaston is the villain of the story. And this is because this story is basically about this, like, miserable proto-feminist seeking to invert virtually every aspect of her reality. And because Gaston represents the natural and ideal state of man... And because they can't change that, since we all recognize instinctively that it's true, they have to instead frame it such that our perception of it is different. So that we perceive him to be the villain of the story, when in actuality, Gaston is the true protagonist of the story. He's the true hero of Beauty and the Beast. And so we have Neo-Gastonism, which is a very simple ideology inspired by the actions of Gaston throughout the story. And it has three tenets. Number one, women aren't allowed to read. Number two, eat lots of eggs. And number three, beat the shit out of furries. It's simple, yet effective. So that's my political platform. I'm a Neo-Gastonist. We've restocked the merch store for the end of the year with a few new designs, one of which, of course, being inspired by the political ideology of the future, which promotes traditional gender roles, an early form of raw egg nationalism, and, of course, war against degenerate sexual behavior. And this is, of course, neo-Gastonism. So go check out the new designs. Late Christmas present idea, maybe. We've also got a white boy winter design that should be up there by now. It's a white boy skiing and kicking up snow onto George Floyd, who's stuck in a snowman. So you're definitely going to want to check that out. But anyways, I am going to give a summary of what the story is actually about, and then we'll go through and analyze the whole thing. So basically, when you view this story objectively, it becomes very clear that the true antagonist of the film is actually Belle, who's manifested some form of pathological narcissistic personality disorder, plain and simple, and the Beast actually serves as this supplementary character, the sort of tragic anti-hero to highlight one half of Belle's nature, which is the Beast of her chaotic feminine nature when left unchecked. And so the true protagonist of the story is actually Gaston, who represents the beauty that Belle could experience if she were subject to the natural order of things under Gaston's authority. And so the title, Beauty and the Beast, properly understood, is 
is not the beauty of Belle and the beastly nature of the prince who's under a spell, but rather the two directions in which Belle's energy can be channeled through a weak and insecure man who will allow her to become a destructive beast, mirroring his nature as a literal beast, or through a strong and capable man who will allow her to become a happy and beautiful wife and mother, mirroring his nature as a beautiful man who has fulfilled his proper role in society. But of course, we are made to believe that Gaston is the antagonist of the story because this film, broadly speaking, is feminist propaganda, which we will get into momentarily along with so much more. But even this is subtly acknowledged during the film's best sequence, the most famous sequence in the film, which is the ballroom dancing sequence with the film's main theme playing in the background. And it sings of a tale as old as time, beauty and the beast. And we hear this and we think, Oh, it must be the Beauty and the Beast that we can see on the screen, but it's not. The film is inviting us to read between the lines. Mrs. Potts is warning us. Think about it. A tale as old as time. This is in reference to the beginning of male-female relationships along with time itself, which of course would bring us back to Genesis and the Garden of Eden. And what do we learn from that story? That the woman's nature, if left unchecked by strong male authority, will lead towards chaos and evil. She is predisposed towards this at an accelerated rate relative to men. And Gaston understands this. He was a hero and a great man who was trying to do right by his people, and yet the narrative frames him as though he is the villain. And we will explain how he tried to save Belle and his town momentarily, but first, ladies and gentlemen, there are three trends occurring simultaneously right now. More and more of you are electing to exercise your Second Amendment rights by arming yourselves. The society is increasingly edging towards the brink of collapse, and Christmas is right around the corner. These things are all related, because you need guns, you need to be carrying guns, and We The People Holsters is the place for you to accomplish these things, so go to wethepeopleholsters.com slash Doyle. This is the holster that's preferred by members of law enforcement, members of the military, all of the people who have the greatest necessity to carry firearms on a daily basis are choosing We The People Holsters, plus there are thousands of options, thousands of five-star reviews from people of all types of occupations and lifestyles, the point being, that with thousands of options to choose from, with them being custom molded to fit your exact firearm for a quick smooth draw, with the custom printing options available to you as well, it is truly no wonder that WeThePeopleHolsters.com specifically slash Doyle is becoming the go-to destination for American patriots who value the responsibility of defending themselves and those around them. So go to WeThePeopleHolsters.com slash Doyle right now, get an additional $10 off with the offer code Doyle, every holster, a lifetime guarantee. If it's not a perfect fit, send it back for a full refund, WeThePeopleHolsters.com com slash Doyle. We the people holsters.com slash Doyle. Very epic, but we continue. So we're going to go through the whole synopsis of the film right now so that I can prove to you that the essence of the film is in fact a revolutionary leftist essence. What it seeks to do is promote the complete inversion of reality as something that makes people happy, something to be celebrated. Woman above man, chaos above order, weakness above strength, etc. And if you're trying to recall the story, you might think it's basically about Belle and the Beast and then this Gaston guy keeps butting in, but it's actually more intricate than that. Because when we first meet Belle, she's lost. And this is because she has no male influence in her life to guide her. Her father's weak, he's old, which is why that relationship is established before the interactions with Gaston and the Beast even become larger parts of the story. Because from the beginning, the whole story is about Belle desperately needing masculine guidance. And Gaston and the Beast are basically competing to occupy that influence in her life, but for very different reasons, as we'll explain. But remember, as we said earlier, this is indicated by the title. Beauty and the Beast are both within Belle, and the struggle in the story is between the two competing forces which will decide which one will embody her essence. Will it be a strong, capable, charismatic, and therefore beautiful man to bring out her beauty? Or will it be an insecure, pathetic, hideous beast, like literal creature, that will fail to control her, which will leave her miserable? Because as we're reminded throughout the whole story, Belle doesn't know what she wants. She has no idea. She doesn't know what's going to make her happy. So naturally, when she makes decisions, they basically like blow up in her face. But yeah. That's the story. So it starts out by describing how exactly the beast came to be. And basically what happened was this poor, ugly old woman came to his castle asking for shelter from a storm. And she told him that she could offer him a rose. And the beast, who at the time was a prince, said no, because she was ugly and poor. And at first you might think that this is based because she had poor physiognomy, but it wasn't. It was actually proto-coomerism because then the woman transforms back into her natural form as a beautiful princess. And the prince immediately starts simping for her. So it wasn't a rejection of her because he inferred from her poor physiognomy that she would have poor character, but rather that he couldn't just like lust after her. And then when he realized that she was actually a beautiful princess, he began simping. And the princess realized that he was this pathetic coomer, and so she punished him by turning him into a furry, which is like an advanced stage of sexual degeneracy. And the only way that he can break the spell and return to normal is if he falls in love with a woman who also is in love with him uh, within a certain amount of time. And if he can't do that, he's going to stay that way forever. And so he starts throwing these temper tantrums and like gets depressed about it and just stays inside the castle. And I will say it's hard for me not to think that the beast 
used is subtly based because he's basically like an autistic incel. But throughout the film, you'll see that this is just a distraction designed to make people like us sympathize with him, think he's a Sigma male or whatever, when in reality, he's just pathetic. And this is a fantastic example of the difference between the Beast, who we're supposed to believe is the hero, and Gaston, who we're supposed to believe is the villain. Because both embody a position of power, but they treat it differently. It's a perfect illustration of what weakness and strength look like when they have power. The Beast acts as a tyrant, whereas Gaston acts as a noble aristocrat. And we see this here when the prince acts selfishly by rejecting the lower class woman from the castle during the storm unless she could satisfy his degenerate sexual desires, whereas a noble aristocrat would feel an obligation towards the lower classes and would help them out, like Gaston, for example. Gaston is nice to his dysgenic manlet friends. In fact, he's basically his sidekick. But even when the beast is a prince, he's a tyrant. And then when he's cursed, he still abuses those around him to where they cower in fear when he's present. And again, this is the difference between weakness and strength when they have power. But anyways, uh, then we're introduced to Belle. She's leaving her house in rural France in this village. It takes place between the mid-1700s, mid-1800s, by the way, which is important because she has no mother figure present. Her father figure is weak. So basically, the people who were supposed to introduce her to the world help her understand how it works, what her role is. They fail to do that. And so she feels displaced. She's singing about how there must be something more than this provincial life. And she sings this after walking through her village, watching the community interact with one another. They're asking about each other's families, watching a mother cradle several beautiful children, etc. And she's on her way to the bookstore because since she has no sense of identity because of the failure of her parents, she has to retreat into books to derive her sense of identity. And she's on her way and the villagers are singing, you know, that girl's so peculiar. She's not like other girls. Yeah, because she rejects her role in the village. Everybody in the village has a job. They are all unseparated from the products of their labor, but not Belle. No, she feels entitled to more than that. There must be something more, but she doesn't work. She doesn't work towards that. She doesn't work towards that something more. She just lives in fantasy about it. She's a single young woman with no obvious skill set. Anything that could bring her more, a job, motherhood, marriage to literally the most admired man in the village, she just rolls her eyes at that. She's entitled. She doesn't know what she wants. And the only cure to this is strong male influence, which she has lacked for her entire life, which is why she's like this. This is why, to reiterate, Belle is the true antagonist of this story. Beauty properly understood is her appearance, and the beast is her nature. Or beauty is Gaston, and the beast is the prince. The true conflict is the weak nature of the beast versus the strong nature of Gaston. But anyways, she goes on to sing, here's where she meets Prince Charming, but she won't discover that it's him until chapter three. And this is actually foreshadowing. This is foreshadowing and meta commentary on the story itself. And the average viewer will understand this foreshadowing as when she meets the beast, but she doesn't realize that he's actually Prince Charming until chapter three or act three, the final part of the story, when the beast is revealed to her to be a prince. But even then, he's not Prince Charming, right? In fact, the whole second act of the story is centered around him being very awkward and uncharismatic. But who does she meet immediately after this song? Who is the next person she speaks to? Gaston. And perhaps it is Gaston who she realizes is the true Prince Charming in the third act when he sacrifices his life trying to save her, not even from the beast, but from herself. And she realizes in that moment the gravity of her decisions and that maybe she should have stopped being so dramatic. And in fact, I will be making the argument that her entire voluntary captivity in the beast's castle was just one giant shit test for Gaston. But anyways, here's where she meets Gaston. He's hunting. He's with his dysgenic manlet friend, his sidekick. And Gaston correctly figures that since he's clearly the best male in town, he deserves Belle because she's the most beautiful girl in town. And Gaston, by the way, is desired by virtually every woman in town, but his eyes are only on Belle. And so he greets her and he takes her book and he asks, how can you read this? There isn't any pictures. And she says, well, some people use their imagination. And this is the essence of Gaston. He values the objective, what he can see, what he knows is true and real. Belle, a narcissist, only values what serves herself. Like, sure, these words are nice, but only because I get to decide what picture they paint. And so Gaston tells her, get your head out of those books, which given the time period in which the story takes place, she was probably reading like revolutionary proto-Marxist literature and Gaston was trying to save her from that. And he says, it's not right for a woman to read. Soon she starts getting ideas and thinking because Gaston understands that the woman is particularly vulnerable to the whispers of the serpent. But jokes aside, what they're trying to do here, if you can't tell, is appeal to this whole... No, I'm a girl and I can get educated. I don't have to have a family. There's more to that. There's more to life than that. Look at this big dumb guy. He can't even read, blah, blah, because they have to appeal to the feminist narrative which this story is serving. But that being said, a hundred years of feminism has vindicated everything that Gaston said. So Belle leaves to go help her father and LeFou makes some joke about him and then Belle gets angry. So Gaston berates his dysgenic manlet friend and defends Belle's father because even though Gaston recognizes that Belle's father is a weak man, he still respects tradition and hierarchy 
that her father still has ownership of her. So Belle gets back home and we learn that her father is an inventor, which in context means that this guy is literally facilitating the propagation of the Industrial Revolution, which will inevitably destroy the fabric of the town he's a part of through automation, through degeneration. But he does this in the name of his pride, winning first prize at the fair or whatever. So he has some form of psychopathic personality disorder. And then he defends Belle's interest in books, which makes sense because that revolutionary literature exists in part as a byproduct of the Industrial Revolution that he exploits for his own pursuit of glory, since this fixation on creating new material things bled into the study of the abstract and the immaterial. But since that largely predated and transcends us, the new information had to just be criticizing all of the traditional information and basically throwing it all out in the name of progress or whatever. So Bell's father is working towards the industrialization of their town, and Gaston understands this. He understands the threat that it poses. But Gaston is an operator above all things, so he bides his time with this, but it will come up again later. So then her father leaves to go to the fair and literally goes down the wrong path as a result of his pride and his unwillingness to delay gratification by taking a longer path against the instincts of the horse, which knew it was dangerous, by the way. And then he asks his horse, well, where have you taken us? Because he is literally incapable of accepting personal responsibility, of course, symptomatic of his psychopathic personality disorder. So then he gets chased by wolves into the castle. He meets the props and he asks, well, how was this accomplished? Because he is incapable of or unwilling to acknowledge the immaterial, that there's clearly witchcraft at play. He would rather think of it in terms of uh, this like hyper sophisticated invention or very early form of transhumanism or something. So the beast comes down and he's upset to find that he's sitting in his chair. He immediately starts melting down, claiming that the man came to stare at him because he's so insecure about his appearance. And it's this really feminine display overall because he simultaneously chooses to come downstairs to get involved in this because he wants attention and conflict. His staff had it under control. It wasn't even remotely in the same area of the castle that he was in, but he chooses to make it his problem and then immediately victimizes himself by claiming that the father is tormenting him for his appearance. Again, the beast is weak and deeply insecure. So the beast imprisons Belle's father. So now Gaston has saved Belle uh, some time. He's gathered the whole town for their wedding. The guys are all happy. The women are all seething out of jealousy because he's not marrying one of them. And then he goes inside Belle's house to tell her about his ideal future, how they're married, how he's providing her with fresh food to cook, how he gives her seven sons. He literally says that, like he is so our guy, but uh, he has a plan, there is order to it. So of course, Belle rejects this because she prefers to deal in disorder, in the chaotic. But instead of saying no, she tells him that she doesn't deserve him, which is another test. And if you've ever courted a young woman, you'll recognize this test. This is her trying to get you to tell her how great she is. But then she publicly humiliates him by throwing him into a mud puddle now she's singing again. She fashions this like makeshift headdress for herself while singing me, his little wife. And then she rips it off, rejecting it, singing again that she just wants so much more than this provincial life because she's literally rejecting her nature as a woman. She perpetually wants more, yet she doesn't know what will make her happy. She's always wanting more, but she doesn't know how to define that. So she runs into this field talking about how she wants adventure, which is symbolic of not wanting to be tied down or whatever. And again, jokes aside, this is the message of the film, and it backfires spectacularly, as we'll explain later on. But it's like, think about that. I want more, I want more. She runs away from this organized wedding. She didn't have to lift a finger. The greatest man in the village, and probably the entire country of France at this point, frankly. And she runs away from that in pursuit of more, and ends up in an empty field. Like, this is very emblematic of the utter state of the Western woman. It's like, I reject the natural order of things. I want more. You're in a field. You're empty, literally in terms of geography and your internalized spirit, you stupid one. But anyways, the horse comes back without her father, and so she goes with the horse to the castle, and she finds her father, but the beast refuses to let him go. And so now she's on her knees in front of him, looking up at him like, please, there must be something I can do, anything. And to the beast's credit here, he just totally rejects her advances because he just goes, no, he's my prisoner. And again, it's, it's hard to write off the beast because he really is subtly based in that he's basically an autistic incel. But anyways, Belle offers to take the place of her father, and the beast agrees if she promises to stay there forever. And at this point, her father, who, yeah, He's not a strong figure in her life, but even he's like, Belle, what are you doing? Don't do this. And it just goes to show how women will literally destroy their own lives just to spite standards that they think are oppressive. Like this girl literally rejected her town and everything that it had to offer. She rejects Gaston, who was literally the ideal male, all because she needs something more. She can't be held down. And then in less than 90 seconds, she agrees to spend the rest of her life in a castle with a monster. And you can say, oh, she did it to save her father. But it's like, first of all, this is 1700s, 1800s France. And that guy 
guy is old and fat. He's sick now. He's got like maybe two years left. Secondly, she's actually contesting her father by disobeying his authority over her and doing so by masquerading it with the typically masculine virtue of sacrifice. She's literally LARPing one of those books that she never should have been reading in the first place, frankly, and this is what happens to her. So she has no true concept of feminine identity because she doesn't have a mother figure. She rejects everything that she's called to do by her community because she regards it to be binding. And so the only sense of identity that she can find in her real life is inspired by that into which she retreated, which are those books. So she tries to be the hero figure because she recognizes the opportunity to do so, but in her pride, she failed to calculate how stupid of a hill it was to die on since her father's gonna be dead soon anyways. Now she's in exactly the situation that she thought that she wanted to avoid, this de facto arranged marriage. So now she's literally in a stone dungeon crying because she thought she was too good to marry Gaston. Remember, the toll will always be paid. Belle assumed authority over her father by sacrificing herself for him, which objectively was a bad move, and now she's crying about it in a room by herself. This is what happens when women are allowed to think for themselves. But then the beast tells her that she can go wherever she wants except for the West Wing. And you'll never guess where this girl decides to go later. It's like you tell a woman not to do something and, and her HUD just recognizes it as like objective updated, do that thing. But then the beast is like, you will join me for dinner. This is not a request. And we have to remember not to be charmed by the beast, not to think that he's our guy because his assertiveness over the woman is not from a place of confidence, but rather his own insecurity lashing out. Like Gaston does this because he's a Chad and the beast is isn't even doing this because he's like a sigma male, but rather because, again, he's basically an autistic incel. And of course, she's like, I won't have dinner with you. Yet again, another shit test, which he fails by throwing a tantrum. But we continue. Now we're at the lodge, all the guys are there, and Gaston's feeling a little bit down after the whole Belle situation earlier, and so the fellas cheer him up by singing a song about how much of a chat he is. Like, they literally have a song dedicated to how epic he is. All the men want to be him, all the women want him, and it's like, if he's the villain, why am I rooting for him? If he's the villain, why is everyone rooting for him? He's drinking with the boys, he's wrestling with the boys, he's singing with the boys, he's playing chess with the boys, he's spitting with the boys, he's shooting with the boys, he flips over the chessboard as a rejection of the abstract in favor of natural law. He's hoisting people up with one arm. He's wrestling all the guys in town at once. He's talking about how he ate four dozen eggs as a boy and now five dozen eggs a day as a man, which is why he's roughly the size of a barge. I mean, this guy is it. He's loved by his community. He rejects books and sources because those are how weak people justify their beliefs since they're incapable of original thought. He takes care of his dysgenic manlet friend. He's dancing with him like, this guy's fantastic. I'd be on his team every day of the week and twice on Sunday. How are we supposed to believe that this guy is the villain? I'm being serious again. Like, Literally, he doesn't even have the typical like, I'm evil and I want to do evil things. Like he's just like, I'm the best and I want to marry Belle. And then the story's like, he's the bad guy because Belle wants to read books and be free in marriage. Marriage would tie her down. Gaston actually demonstrates a proper understanding of love, by the way, which the beast doesn't. We'll talk about that a bit later. But now since the beast fails the shit test and Belle's not coming to dinner, the beast is in his room sulking like, she'll never see me as anything but a monster. It's hopeless. She's going total doomer mode. Meanwhile, Belle manipulates Clocksworth by exploiting his love of presenting information about the castle through tours to explore the one area she wasn't supposed to go to. And she finds the rose from the beginning with the witch. And she's like, oh, this rose in a glass case, so nothing will touch it. I'm going to go ahead and remove the glass case and try to touch it. And then the beast finds her and gets angry because she did the one thing that she wasn't supposed to do and then she immediately starts crying and victimizing herself now she's fleeing the castle because she has no principles she only cares about what immediately validates her ego first it was a hero complex now it's this i'm too good to get in trouble for doing things that i wasn't supposed to be doing mentality so she makes a promise to stay there forever breaks the rules decides she's not at fault and then breaks the commitment like this is literally how no fault divorce works she doesn't know what's good for her she always wants more she's always too good for whatever environment she's in now she's getting attacked by wolves and so then she's saved by the beast she goes back to the castle with him and now she's like trying to clean his wounds but again the beast gets into this like autistic episode where he's growling at her for trying to touch his wounds and he's like larping as an animal because remember bell thinks he's actually a beast but he's not and he knows that. He's still a man, but he's LARPing. But anyways, then he gives her a whole library, like the biggest library you've ever seen. And that should tell you all you need to know right there. Like literally the Chad, don't read books versus the Virgin. Um, here, take all of them. And then we get into this really weird montage of the beast, like learning to behave or whatever. And what's important to note here is that Belle's validation and purpose comes only from control and power. She needed to artificially and socially engineer the beast into something he isn't to feel validated and powerful. Gaston wasn't enough for her because he was 
was already perfect. And she rejected the feminine attitude shared by virtually every woman in the village, which was that their validation was to come from being the wife of the best man. But since that implied a position of submissiveness to the man, it did not satisfy the revolutionary ego of Belle, who by this point is a sexual Marxist. And she even brags about this in a song how she's able to change the beast into a perversion of itself. And you might say, but he's a person underneath. Yeah, but she doesn't know that, remember? She's literally trying to normalize bestiality to herself. White women and bestiality. Talk about a tale as old as time. I will not elaborate on this. However, just know that there is no greater indication that a white woman has given up on having a family than her adopting a male dog in her late 20s, early 30s. Like, we all know a few of those. But here's something else important to note. The happiest Belle is seen in the entire movie is during the tale as old as time sequence. Look at why that is. She's in a place in the middle of nowhere that she's totally unfamiliar with. She's surrounded by transhumanist, sentient occult objects that talk. She's romancing a literal monster. Everything around her is completely inverted because Belle can only thrive in chaos, in the realm of the unnatural. She's rejected her home and her spot at the top of the feminine hierarchy in favor of the complete inversion of everything that she formerly knew because Belle at her core possesses that revolutionary chaotic spirit, which is the consequence of unchecked feminine energy, not guided by a mother, not checked by her father and influenced by proto-Marxist literature, and now she can only find purpose through chaos. And this is why the tale as old as time is in reference to the true plot of the film. Think about it. As old as time. What is that in reference to? Genesis in the Garden of Eden, where we see what happens when unchecked feminine nature is allowed to manifest. And this is dog whistling to the audience that they have to read between the lines and see that the true story is about the chaos and the order of the female condition. And whether it will be the weak man or the strong man to channel her energy in destructive or productive ways respectively. Beauty and the Beast are the competing sides of Belle, reflected by whichever force is able to channel her energy. The beautiful Gaston, bringing out her beauty within the natural order of things, or the hideous Beast, doing the opposite allowing her to become a destructive beast. But even then, stop laughing, this is serious. Even then, inherent to chaos is that it's always changing. So she still can't be happy in this ideally chaotic environment that she's created. And so the beast releases Belle so that she can go back to being with her still sick and dying father. And like, as a man, I can't respect this. Like she literally puts you through all of that. And then she's just gonna go back to the life that she wholeheartedly rejected in the first place. Plus it's this whole like, as long as she's happy, that's all that matters mentality, which is just rationalized weakness. That's all that is. And this is the opposite of Gaston, which we'll talk about in a second. But again, the true nature of the beast is revealed. He is a selfish aristocrat. His entire help, his best and only friends are counting on him to break this curse. And he throws it away for his own self-image of being like this compassionate, understanding guy or whatever. He's at the top. He's in control. He has an obligation to his people and he throws it away out of weakness. He's pathetic. So Belle finds her father. Update, he's still dying. And now there's an angry mob coming to lock Belle's father in the insane asylum for trying to undermine the distributist agrarian economic model of the town, and also for ineffectively spreading word about the beast because nobody actually respects him or takes him seriously, and so they just assume that he's crazy. So Gaston tells Belle that he can make all of this stop if she just agrees to marry him. And Belle says no, because being married to the literal ideal man and living happily ever after to save her father is frankly beyond the scope of her operations, unlike agreeing to live in a castle with a literal monster for the rest of her life to save her father earlier right? And this is because Belle's true mission above all else is rejecting male authority. She does this by rejecting her father's wishes in the beginning where she gets herself locked up. Now she rejects Gaston's wishes and presumably her father's wishes since he's anti-beast and at least Gaston's sympathetic or Gaston adjacent at this point to let him be taken away instead of, God forbid, taking a break from having the Midas touch of chaos. And like we said earlier, Gaston is an operative. He understands that Maurice's work as an inventor will ultimately be destructive to his town in the long run. But he's also willing to let Maurice continue to be free if Belle marries him because he knows that his seven sons will end up wielding enough power in the town to counteract any of those negative effects. But for the time being, he's fine with just removing him from the society to go to the insane asylum. And this is when Belle turns her subversive efforts to the townsfolk. She exposes them to her occult mirror prop and tells them about this mythical creature because she wants them to think that her father isn't actually crazy. And she wants to get the townsfolk to indulge in her occult bestiality fantasy with her. And it is here when Gaston realizes that this has all been one big shit test. He tells tells Belle that he suspects that she has feelings for the monster. And Belle replies by saying, he's no monster, Gaston, you are. And at this point, Gaston realizes that Belle exists to pervert and degenerate everything that she comes into contact with. It is no longer about his dream of making her his wife and giving her a happy and fulfilling life. Gaston realizes now that it is more than that. It is about an obligation to his people. She is the ultimate wielder of 
of destructive feminine energy. And he realizes that the only way to stop it is for him to finally take control of her and provide to her that authoritative masculine influence that she so desperately needs. Her father's influence is taken care of. It's removed. He's gone now. So the only thing left is this monster. So Gaston begins basically like rhetorically psyoping the townsfolk to garner support for his cause, basically just like inventing these bad outcomes that could potentially happen to scare people. And because he's respected, within seconds, the men are marching with Gaston to the castle to kill the beast, singing Gaston's praises the entire way there. They're singing, we're counting on Gaston to lead the way. And this is Gaston's arc as the true protagonist of the story. If there's two things he's known for, it's being the best hunter in the village and attracting the most women in the village. And so now he must conquer his most deadly hunt yet in order to stop the true beast, Belle's destructive feminine energy, thereby conquering the most beautiful woman in the process because Gaston is the hero. Belle is the villain. And the beast is basically a tragic anti-hero. And in fact, the beast is such a weak leader that when the castle is under attack, he's pouting in the West Wing with no plan, no way to inspire his people, whereas Gaston literally just makes up a few stories, and within five minutes, he has an armed caravan about to storm the castle, they've got a song prepared, and because Gaston is a true aristocrat with honor, he tells those below him that they can have whatever they can find for themselves. However, the beast is rightfully his because he's the leader, and the people all respect this because they respect Gaston, because Gaston has a true allegiance to noble and traditional aristocracy. And in fact, the castle's counter attacked wasn't even launched by the beast. It was launched by a candle. But then Gaston finds the beast, and the beast, seeing an arrow aimed at him, he literally turns away because he's pouting over a woman. Gaston recognizes this and tries to do him a favor by at least awarding him a soldier's death. So he shoots him with an arrow, and instead of just continuing to shoot him with arrows and killing him, he lets the beast go out fighting. But the beast refuses to fight back, but then Belle shows up, and oh, now the beast is fighting back, and Gaston yells, it's over, beast, Belle is mine. But what does this mean? What does he mean, it? It is over. Something that he and the beast have both been experiencing. Gaston means this metaphorically. It's over, meaning Belle's reign of chaos. She will now be under his authority and she will be happier and stabler for that. The beast cannot have this because he's insecure. He would rather have Belle be in control over him and continue to invert reality than have her be with another man. This is different than Gaston, who asserts himself from a place of objective value and confidence. The beast asserts himself from a place of insecurity. Gaston being with Belle would make both of them happiest, but the beast being with Belle would just make the beast happiest happiest, or at least less miserable, which is why he was literally willing to let Gaston kill him about two minutes prior to this. This is the difference between confident, capable love, and weak, insecure love. The beast let Belle go because he just wanted her to be happy or whatever. Gaston says, no, I can make her the happiest and provide to her the best life, and I will stop at nothing to do this for her. But the beast is incapable of this because he acts exclusively through insecurity. And so then the beast lashes out and almost kills Gaston out of insecurity, not out of Belle's best interest. And this really is a Cain and Abel situation. So Gaston, who's not prideful like Belle, who's not insecure like the beast, he humbles himself and asks the beast for mercy. He's a leader above all else, and he knows at this point the only way to save the objective and stay in the fight is to ask for mercy. So the beast lets him go, and then gets distracted by Belle, and so Gaston capitalizes on this, and he stabs the beast. But because of the rain, he loses his footing and tragically falls to his death. Now, this is where the story actually ends. Everything else is basically just a humiliation ritual and feminist propaganda, because Gaston understood that the beast in his animal form was pathetic, and that he couldn't properly properly love Bell because he was a weak man. And so he sought to put him out of his misery and do the job that he was incapable of doing. And still, the beast didn't even defeat Gaston. At no point did he best Gaston in any capacity. He literally won via technicality. But now he's still dying, but he says, well, maybe it's better this way because he's realizing that he just killed Gaston over a literal woman and his own insecurity. And that if he just stays with Bell now, more destruction is the inevitable result. He realizes that Bell inadvertently killed the most beloved man in the whole village and now Belle, trying to maintain her control over the beast, commands him, no, don't talk like that. So then Belle says that she loves him. The curse breaks, and now the prince is back through this shape-shifting ritual, and guess what? He is significantly less handsome than Gaston. Now they're getting married, and it's like, who are all these people at the wedding? Where did they come from? I don't know. There were a lot of other questions left to be answered. Does LeFou avenge Gaston's death? How long did it end up taking for Maurice to die? Would Belle and Gaston's children have recognized the state of Israel? I don't know. But the true moral of the story is that the nature of nature is right. What is natural is therefore right. Inversion of the natural order is inherently chaotic and therefore destructive, and man must be above woman to prevent or at least minimize that, generally speaking. And honestly, I think Gaston just got unlucky. I don't really think there was anything else he could have done. You know, you could say that he should have just shot the beast with more arrows and finished him off, but it's like Gaston just 
He just really had this understanding of honor and chivalry that we just can't comprehend. So he, he's a hero. He died doing what was right. And we honor his sacrifice by upholding the principles of Neo-Gastonism in our everyday lives. So check out the Neo-Gastonist shirt. Check out the new and restocked merch. Check out getundertech.com if you want some really solid underwear. They're a good friend of the channel. But other than that, you know, have a Merry Christmas and uh, we'll see you next year. Hey guys, if you like this video, leave it a thumbs up, leave it a comment, subscribe to the channel, turn on post notifications so that you are notified in the event that I post, which will be happening so much more frequently in 2022. And of course, share the video with a friend. Uh, yeah, thank you for watching. Very epic 20 second intro. You thought you'd get a two minute intro? Wait a minute, outro, that's the word I'm looking for. I'm in a little bit of a rush. I have a plane to catch. I'm coming home for Christmas, mom. And of course, everyone else who would uh, want to be wanting to see me, but uh I don't know. That just seemed like the obvious, you know, I'm on TV. Hi, mom. Well, this isn't TV. I'm going to stop. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next year. May God bless America. Poof.